Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, when I was explaining the assignment, the first theory that uh, we went through was uh, Sigmund Freud's psychosexual stages. We saw some problems with it, but all in all, its purpose was to try and explain how our basic biological drives, our drives towards creation and death, drive our, our, our world through, through, through the process of evolution and all those types of situations that we talked about. So, so that's an example of biological theory. Um, I will say, you know, theory-wise, when we look at biology, when we get to the different stages of, of uh, development, we probably won't use a, a theory-driven process. We'll just say this is the growth that is going on during these time periods um, so that um, we, we have an understanding of the actual physical development that is happening during these age groups. Um, but these next two theories are ones that we will talk about when we get to different sections across the lifestyle. Um, the, the first one is Piaget's um, cognitive development theory. And it's important to note that Piaget is only focusing on cognitive development. Um, he doesn't talk much about the biological processes or, or um, uh, social emotional processes. Um, his is all about how do we construct our internal world? How do we construct objects? Um, how do we understand the world? What's the process of decision making that we go through? And he's going to offer it in a stage theory with two really basic concepts of a simulation versus accommodation. And its most basic definition, a simulation is having a new category of something, okay? Accommodation is when something comes along and it looks similar, but it's not quite. So you have to create some type of either subcategory or a separate category for the object. The example we used on Monday was dogs and cats. So you have a original category of dogs and then a cat comes along, has very similar features, but behaves and sounds different and, and is shaped different. So you have to accommodate that information, okay? And we will compare his theory to Vygotsky. Um, here in a little while, Vygotsky really took this assimilation and accommodation idea into the co concept of scaffolding, which really is used in education and building uh, a child or a person's knowledge. You start kind of with the basics. So you start with some new information and then you build upon that. And if you think about um, maybe a, an example of uh, uh, of this process is is mathematics and math classes, right? We start with addition, subtraction, then we add division, multiplication, and then we add letters. <laughs> uh, and then we combine all of those things. So it's a scaffolding or building process of adding new things to a concept. But we'll get to that in a little while. But that's kind of the similar kind of process that um, that that that, that uh, is meant by this assimilation and accommodation of new and integrative information. So, for his theory, he has what's called a four-stage theory, and um, again, uh, his he meant for his. Uh, 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 final stage to be the last stage of development. And once you're there, you're there and you're fixed and you're done. But as we will see again um, with this theory that the, this development really goes on well beyond uh, just uh, age 11 or so into young adulthood, okay? Um, but he starts out with uh, some conceptualizations of, of, of um uh, the world that young children exist in and some of the things that they, they're experiencing, okay? And so his first stage is zero to two. Um, and what uh, Piaget feels is that the age from zero to two is about the integration of 
stimuli in the environment and your ability to interact with that, uh, that, that environment. So in, in the most basic fo form, you know, if you think about a child who, um, uh, who has a bottle, it's the ability to recognize that bottle out there in space and to take one of your hands and motor and get that bottle, lift it, and then, uh, of course, bring it to your mouth so you could uh, get sustenance. Um, and so the, the main uh, uh, stage for, for uh, Piaget during this area is that it's all about integration with sensory information and your body operating or motorizing in that environment. Okay. What uh, Piaget noticed, and, and, and remember, we, he, these are younger technologies that we're using, and we're, we'll get into this kind of a little bit more about some of the problems with just assuming that that's what infancy is about here in a little while. But what he observed is that um, infants up to about 24 months or two years of age Bell to do something he called object permanence, okay? So in the most basic research um, paradigm, and this is one of the differences between Piaget's theory and let's say Freud's theory, is to go from one stage to the next, a, a child has to be able to understand some task, some concept, okay? And the first task or concept that Piaget theorized about is the notion of what's called object permanence. And I'll give kind of the, again, the basic research paradigm. You have a child either on the floor or a small table, and you have a small curtain, okay? And then in front of the curtain, you have a, a little teddy bear. Maybe it's the favorite, the, the child's favorite teddy bear, okay? And you take that teddy bear and, and you get the child to recognize it in some way. And then you take that teddy bear and put it behind the curtain, okay? And then you, either in a nonverbal way or a verbal way, you basically ask the child, where is the bear, okay? And if I were to put it in kind of um, terms, if, if young children could talk like this, um, they would say, um, what bear? It, it no longer exists, okay? And so the notion that, that Piaget brings up is in the infant world, things only exist within its immediate sensory environment, okay? And, you know, some evidence for this in, in modern time is uh, if you want to be really cruel to your infant, um, have your babysitter at their house have brand new clothing and everything, blank, brand new blankets that have not been touched by you or your spouse uh, and just have them there. And when you take the infant to the um, uh, babysitter's house, undress the infant and have them with their blanket, put them in the newly freshly laundered stuff that doesn't have your smell or anything about it and leave. Okay, I promise you, your babysitter will not babysit for you again, uh, because in the immediate environment, because you're not there, you don't have, they don't, they can't smell you, they can't see you, they can't hear you, you've stopped existing, okay, and uh, the infant will act in accordance. Um, we learned these lessons in early days of uh, child cares and daycare centers where it was, you know, the very, very sterile environment and you weren't allowed to bring objects from home and stuff and coats were put in, you know, a locker and you weren't, the kids weren't given access to their little blankies and stuff. It created a lot of chaos when, when we started caring for infants in the child care setting. So it's kind of where that lesson came from. But Somewhere in, in the, the research paradigm that Piaget was doing is somewhere along 24 months, they would take the bear, put it behind the curtain, ask the child, where's the bear? They would say, you idiot, you just put it behind the curtain. Or they would reach and they'd move the curtain out of the way and grab the bear. 
What this represented for Piaget is the ability to hold information in the mind, to realize that you ha can have a mental representation of something. Something doesn't stop to exist just because it's not in your sensory location. So he felt that this was a transition phase from what was known as the sensory motor period to the pre-operational period, okay? The pre-operational period is the development of symbolic thought, okay? Meaning what we're doing is representing objects in our mind. Um, and, you know, uh, I think I mentioned this in our first week or so, it, when we think about the amount of symbols that children are learning, on average, between the age of zero to six, seven, uh, children learn over around, well, on average, around 60,000 different words, okay? Um, and, and you think about the significant amount of information that that, that creates for the child, it makes sense what we end up doing in stage three, which we'll get to here in just a moment, okay? Um, but some um, very common uh, um, attributes of this stage two, this pre-operational phase, is the concept of irreversibility, okay? Um, irreversibility is uh, the little child breaks their car and they don't realize that the car can be put back together, okay? Uh, the child drops a cup on the floor, the cup cracks, he, he or she doesn't realize that it can be put back or fixed, okay? This is the notion of irreversibility that is, is highlighted uh, in this age group, okay? The other one is centration and egocentrism which is uh, the notion that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the child feels like because everyone is giving the attention, the educate, formal education system is starting, giving the child attention, the parents giving attention, that they are kind of the center of the world. They're kind of, everything is about them, okay? Um, and so uh, egocentrism is, is also a, a, a highlight of this period of time. Um, and if you think about it, it, it kind of makes sense because they, they have so much overwhelming information that they're storing during this period. It's hard to think about yourself outside, like other people have meanings and purposes and all those kinds of things. So in a sense, because of the overwhelming amount of information the child is learning, it kind of hard to get out of that egocentric mindset, okay? Uh, we will come back to these stages and talk about some difficulties with some of these concepts, uh, but for now, that's that that's what we have. Okay, so around age six and seven, we're reaching like a cognitive capacity for information. Okay, so what do we need to do with that um, information? Is we need to start categorizing it. Okay, and we're going to categorize it in such a way that um, this, this next stage of development is really about black and white thinking. It's about categories. There's good people, there's bad people. There's black, there's white. There's um, uh, criminals and there's um, uh, uh, police officers. Um, uh, so it's very, very, very categorical. And, and it's a and and in this phase, there's kind of no gray in the world. It's and we'll get to that. But I want to get to the two tests that kind of show how children um, um, are are progressing from pre-operational to concrete. Because what do we have to do with our symbolized information? Is we have to be able to transform it without it losing its meaning. Okay. And what uh, Piaget noticed is around six, seven years old, children are able to do some certain tasks. Um, and we'll, let's see, we have these. Um, and they're what we call con uh, conservation tasks, okay? 
And in both of these examples, I, I just want to note here, a child under the age, when, when Piaget was doing his research under the sages, fell at these tasks, okay? Whereas when they get around uh, six, seven years old, they're able to properly uh, do these tasks. So I'm going to bring up the clay example. I'm going to use this example of the beakers, okay? In this conference uh, conservation task, you have three beakers. Two of them are the same size as denoted by A and B. And then you have a third one that is differently shaped, okay? And then you fill A and B with the same amount of liquid. And then in front of the child, you put the liquid, and well, I should put, go back here, and you ask the child, are these the same? And even children under the age of six or seven will say, yes, they're, they're, they're the same amount. Okay, but then we take the liquid out of this cup and put it into this differently shaped uh, beaker. Okay, and we ask the child again, is, do, does A, now does A and C have the same amount of liquid? Okay, children between, under the age of about six or seven will say no, based on this differently shaped, they'll either say there's more or there's less liquid now. Okay, children over the age of six or seven will say, yes, it's still the same amount. It's just in a differently shaped container. Okay, um, this is the notion of conservation that amounts don't change based upon where they at. The amount will stay the same. Okay, so this is task one. What's the child being able to do in this thing? Is it saying they're being able to say, just because I put something in something different, I put something in the category, it doesn't change its meaning. It doesn't change its value, okay? So that's, that, that's task one, okay? The other task, and, and, and you can do this with clay balls too, I should say you can have two clay balls and you say, are these the same? And then if you squish one, you ask if there's more or less. And that one tends to work better with younger children. Um, if you want to test these things at home, um, that's a clay ball example. But the, the, the three mountain um, uh, a task, if you could imagine that this is a round table, okay, and, and uh, uh, on one view, there's a smaller tree, and then over the mountain, there's a larger, lighter tree, okay? And, um, and, and the basis of this task is either Piaget or the mom would ask the child what the child sees, okay? And uh, in this task, the child will appropriately say, well, I see a big light tree, the mountain, and a smaller, skinnier, darker tree, okay? And again, most children under the age of six or seven will get this task correctly, okay? Now, now what Piaget asks is, okay, all right, I see what you see. What do I see? Or mom, or mom will ask, what does mom see? Okay. Well, if the child is correct, I'm going to remember, rotate this, it'll be on my left. Uh, it should, the child should say, I see the smaller green tree, because it would be on the left, right? Left. The, the mountain, and on the right, I would see this bigger, thicker, lighter tree, okay? What Piaget found, again, is children under the age of about six or seven will give the child's view again. They will say, well, you see what I see. You see this big green tree, a mountain, and a smaller tree. And again, somewhere between the age of about six or seven, the children are able to say, well, you see, because I see this, you see the smaller green tree, the mountain, and the bigger, lighter green tree. That's what you see, okay? Now, what did this represent for Piaget? So in that first conservation task, it was the changing of a liquid, knowing that the it doesn't change even if you put it in it something else. This one is a, needing to be able to take an object in your mind and mentally rotate it and manipulate it within your mind. Because what it requires the child to see, do, 
If the child doesn't move, what it takes is the child to sit there and mentally rotate the entire table until they feel like they have the same view as Piaget or the mom, okay? So this is a task showing that the child is able to manipulate their environment. They're able to mentally see uh, what is going on. And this is also, uh, you'll notice that one of the, the, the notions within uh, this one is this notion of irreversibility goes away, okay? Because the child is now able to take that broken object, put it in their brain, and imagine putting it back together. So, so the notion of irreversibility goes away when we're in the concrete operational phase, okay? Um, and like I said, the major cognitive notion of this stage is it's a very black and white zone. If you talk to young children during this time and, and you ask them, uh, you know, questions that are more abstract, they will try to put it in some concrete form, okay? The final stage um, is, is really kind of more of a mental task. Uh, usually happens around puberty, as you can see here, around the age of 11 or so. And this is the formal operation phase. And this is done more by paper and pen kind of tasks, um, where you would simply ask someone, you know, can, can, can a, can a uh, robber be a good person, for example, okay? Uh, because what formal operations period is, is to be able to see that the world is more complicated than it is, and we exist more in the gray than we do in these far categories. So it's the ability to say, um, you know, um, I'll, well, I'll speak to uh, when I worked in the prison system and I worked with uh, female inmates. There were a lot of women in there that made bad decisions, and you can't deny that. Okay. They made bad decisions, but they were really good in other areas of their life. Um, I met uh, several um, uh, female inmates who were excellent mothers during visitation, who were very caring and loving. Um, they weren't just these cold robbers or rapists or uh, aggressors or um, the like. That yes, they they do something bad, but they also have good qualities as well. You, you're melding the gray. And it's the same notion if we look at, you know, police officers. Um, instead of seeing them as, as the champions, super moral, it's understanding that police officers can also make bad decisions. That yes, they're, they're, they're in a quote unquote virtuous job, as you would say, trying to keep the peace, but they also are capable of having bad uh, uh, um, um, qualities as well. One being, you know, if we look at um, uh, things like domestic violence based on occupation, uh, the law enforcement arena, the military arenas tend to have higher rates of domestic violence. And we can also see like in the military who are supposed to be the virtues and the protectors of the country, we also see higher rates of rape within this community. So it's the ability to see that gray. It's that ability to see the humanness in everyone, okay? All right, I, I, I'm gonna stop really quick and I just wanted before I give a critique of Piaget's theory, do we have just a basic understanding of these different uh, stages as um, Piaget presented? Um, um, Raphael, are you okay with these so far? Yes, okay. he said a question about when he said um, in the stage area, uh, I think he said something like um, we are not in the gray area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a transition between that concrete black and white thinking into more of the formal operations, kind of given the analogy again of, you know, we live more in gray than we do black and white. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everybody um, uh, in Zoom land, okay so far? Okay. Yes. All right, all right. So now let's give some critiques about um, uh, Piaget's theory, 
Um, one, since his theory has been developed, a lot of these lines of, of fixed age groups have changed uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, the notion of, for example, uh, object permanence, we know infants can learn it much, much younger than um, um, uh, 20, 24 months of age. We see some children learning it by six months of age, for example. Um, when we look at these other stages, um, we can't compare one as being more superior than the other. But let me go back to stage one, too, because we know that this period is not just about sensory motor action. And we'll talk a lot more about this when we talk about infancy, but I'm just going to give a little bit of a laundry list that infants are good at. In fact, in some cases, they're better at it than adults are. Uh, for example, um, statistics and probability and mathematics. Believe it or not, infants with no formal mathematics or statistics training make more better and accurate probabilities of events than adults do with formal statistics and logics training, okay? Um, I'm trying to think of uh, the recognition of, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll just use these two examples so we can move on. Uh, Infants are able to make moral judgments, okay? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to give this simple research paradigm, and we see these uh, as young as four to six months of age. Um, so you present uh, pictures, and these pictures have no emotions in them, okay? There's no discernible happiness, sadness, anger, or aggression. But what uh, they do in this very simple research paradigm is they present the infant with pictures of quote unquote good people and quote unquote bad people. So, you know, pictures of uh, Hitler, of um, uh, serial killers, of, uh, 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 you know, people who have really done some evil things, okay, or what we would define as evil. And then they show them pictures of people who are traditionally seen as, as good and altruistic. So, you know, Mother Teresa, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, and um, uh, individuals like that, okay? And again, they, they're, there's no discern, discernible emotion of happiness, sadness, aggression, or anger. What we find is infants as young as four to six months will do what's called withdraw behaviors to the pictures of, uh, of, of um, uh, Hitler, for example, and they will almost get in a fetal position and they'll try to avoid eye contact whereas they will do approach pictures for pictures, for example, like Martin Luther King, they'll try to reach out their hands, they will stare at them longer, they will pay more attention to those, okay? So that, that notes that children do have a sense of social morality in a sense, you know, a sense of these people are good for me and these people are bad for me. What we think happens with the whole math thing and with the whole discerning between good and bad people is when children get into language, they get into socialization, that as a society, we socialize those things out of the child. So we socialize uh, our fear of mathematics and statistics and probability. We socialize the notion of people you really should approach and people you really should stay away from through our socialization processes. So we think that's what happens with those capacities. Those are just two examples. We'll have some more examples as we move into this specific stage of development, um, hopefully maybe starting next week. Okay. The other thing that we need to recognize is that each of these stages is not necessarily better than another. Okay, and let me let me explain this. Cross-cultural research on Piaget's theory recognizes that the stage of development that a person is in is congruent with the environment in which they exist. Okay, and the demands of the environment. 
So the first comparison, let's do the, let's do a first comparison between, let's say, the United States and Germany. Okay. The majority of Americans here in the United States, the majority of us stick in the concrete operational phase where things are black and white. Okay. Whereas the majority of Germans go to formal operations, which is more gray, which is more recognizing things have value, both good and bad. Okay. Now the question is, is well, does this make Germans more moral, more and the answer is no. Because to explain this difference, we need to look at the demands an environment puts on a person, okay? And the demands here in the United States is we very much have a culture that focuses either on failure and success, losers and winners, good, bad, law-abiding citizen, law-breaking citizen. And so our world is really constructed in categories, okay? So for us to navigate the, the American culture, this stage makes sense for us, okay? Now, in Germany, where things are a lot grayer because of the, we, we could say the 20th century, where you, you know, your country at one point is de deemed a virtuous uh, uh, um, um, superior society, and uh, then you're deemed as uh, one of the most evil societies in the world, um, and uh, uh, you you understand that uh, progression isn't just a good thing, bad thing. Uh, the, the, the German people had to learn how to live within that gray arena of uh, my people uh, tried to do good, but it was bad, um, am I a good person or am I a bad person? Well, because of my history, I have both of those qualities, but I don't have to live like that, but I can't categorize myself in either one of those categories. So because of their history and because of the way their culture is, it makes much more sense for them to be in the formal operations phase, okay? Now, there has been some comparisons to, to uh, different smaller uh, groups. So for example, when we look at Piaget's cognitive uh, stages with uh, uh, smaller tribes that are, tend to be very isolated in New Guinea and the Amazon where, where the environment very much restricts um, um, uh, uh, your movement, where you have to get to know your environment, it makes much more sense to be in stage two. And this is what we find is the majority of individuals in tribal areas in the Amazon and in New Guinea tend to be in stage two. Because what do you need in this? Okay, one, you have to have a good sensory understanding of your environment because of, for example, in the Amazon, the Amazon is constantly changing. The dangers from day to day are different. Whereas here in the United States and in Germany, our day to day situation tends to be stable and consistent. We can go to the grocery store and buy lunch and we know that. Whereas in the Amazon, you never know where the sources of food are. You have to really have a good sensory interaction with that world. The other thing that you need to be able to do is look at the demands of the immediate environment. So what are those things that can harm me, that are good for me? And you can't do that if you're thinking, well, you know, is this leaf good or bad? Is it, you know, no, you have to be able to identify things very quickly. And that's much more of a pre-operational function, okay? So my point of, of this cross-cultural comparison is that we can't say that people in stage four are somehow more cognitively superior than someone, say, say in stage one or two. The reason why I state that is if you take someone from the Americas or from the Europeans and you throw them in the Amazon, um, uh, there's some things that will probably happen. One, 
we have to take a lot of equipment with us. <laughs> you know, we have to take compasses and maps and, and tents and this and that. And the other thing that most people who explore the Amazon region and the New Guinea is they have to have someone from the Amazon and the New Guinea there as a guide because you can't guide yourself. So these individuals won't survive in that same environment as the individuals who exist there and, um, and, and, and thrive there, okay? So um, again, uh, I, you know, when we look at our Western society and we look at this, yeah, we can say, okay, we start in this zone and we work our way up to here and maybe we get up to formal operations. But we can't assume that someone who is here um, is 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 necessarily um, um, less than because of the context in which they're raised. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. All right, let's get into, so that's a cognitive model. As you notice, we focus purely on how people construct their world mentally okay, and how they go about looking at the world and solving things like uh, who belongs to what category or what group, um, manipulation of objects, mental rotation, decision-making, all of those things. The next theory that we're gonna talk about is a socio-emotional model. It's called psychosocial here, but it's really a socio-emotional model, which when we go back to our three categories is our relationship with the world and what the world brings out in us and what we bring out in the world, okay? And um, the person that is most uh, recognized for this is Eric Erickson, because he did two things. One, he focused on human relationships and the emotional uh, relationships between individuals. Two, his is the first one that goes across the entire lifespan. Erickson didn't believe that we stopped developing at 18. He believed that relationships in our world exist well beyond the age of 18. And that there's a lot of other things that we need to go through to have a complete and fulfilling life, okay? Erickson's model is what we call a crisis model because what he believed is is at each stage of development we have a certain crisis that we need to go through and if we're successful with that crisis we will go on and 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 be able to get into the next uh life cycle or life development in in a healthier way or a more productive way if we uh, uh, fell at this crisis, then we'll go into uh, the next phase with a deficit, okay? This is how this model is gonna be presented in the class. We're gonna look at it very dichotically, okay? We're gonna look at pure trust. For example, in infancy, we're gonna talk about trust versus mistrust. And we're gonna talk about uh, what pure 100% trust looks like and pure 100% mistrust looks like. But what I would like you to do, do with this on your evaluation of this theory is I want you to think about these concepts on a continuum, okay, between have, having the development of complete trust versus complete mistrust. And we're all somewhere in between. You know, I, I, I know as a dad, I like to think that I was a really good dad. I like to think that um, I developed trust with my son, but I also know I had bad days <laughs> and then I'm a human being and I made bad decisions with my son. And so I know that he's somewhere, as an example, somewhere between being able to develop, have complete trust in his world versus uh, mistrust. He's somewhere in between there because um, we're all human and uh, as parents, as caregivers, uh, we make mistakes, and as children, um, we don't always react in a way that is in our most advantageous way. All right, all right. So let's talk about, let's get through this first phase um, so that we kind of have an example of what uh, we're talking about. 
the first uh, crisis that uh, um, Erickson felt we go through is the notion of trust versus mistrust, okay? Trust being that um, I can rely on other people to be there when I need them, and they can rely on me. And as long as we maintain a relationship, a reciprocal relationship, that trust can be ongoing, okay? Mistrust is the notion that I can't trust anybody. I, I, I can't, no one in the world can be trusted, okay? And he put this in the period of infancy between one and a, this says one and a half, two years old, because, um, you know, when we look at this age group of about one and a half to two years of age, the one thing that we know is that the infant is pretty much completely dependent on a caregiver, okay? Meaning that without the caregiver's intervention, they're not able to fully feed themselves, uh, warm themselves, um, clean themselves, those types of things, okay? Uh, around one and a half to two years of age, children are able to sustain themselves biologically. I know a lot of parents might disagree with this, but, you know, by about the age of two, a child is able to warm and comfort themselves. They're able to uh, find shelter. They're able to uh, crawl into a cabinet and pull out some food uh, by the, about this period of time. And so they, they're less dependent on the, the, on the caregiver. So um, Erickson felt that this period of complete dependency is a good time for a child to go through this notion of trust versus mistrust. And what do these two things look like? So trust, and again, we're, we're looking at this on a very dichotic uh, uh, level. So one extreme versus the other extreme. On the level of trust, it's baby cries, mom shows up, and I'm going to use moms. It could be dads, it could be caregivers, but I like moms. Uh, mom shows up, feeds the baby, and after the feeding, and I don't know if any moms and dads have experienced this with your infant or anything, after your, and if you pay attention, you both have this moment, <laughs> this reciprocal moment where the baby looks, hey, you're pretty cool. And you look at the baby and, you, you know, you have this warm, fuzzy feeling, okay? And we call that the, the you know, in modern times, a caregiver-infant interaction, Okay, the mom puts the baby back, mom leaves, baby cries, mom comes and change, we have the moment, um, baby, and, and, and there's this interaction. Every time the infant cries, someone shows up, and as long as that infant reciprocates that, the caregiver will show up um, the next time, okay? To understand mistrust, the thing that we have to recognize is infants don't have quote unquote language, words, okay? Our first language is emotions. While infants may not understand what we say uh, semantically, they understand our emotions and, and they're very good at it. So when I give this next example, I want you to feel the emotion, not necessarily the words that I say, okay? So in the complete mistrust side of it is, is baby cries, no one shows up. Baby cries, no one shows up. Baby cries, no one shows up. Baby cries, door swings open. Mom goes, what in the hell do you need now? I'm watching my show. What could you possibly need? Now, again, don't pay attention to the words, pay attention to the emotions that those words elicit, okay? And if you can imagine in a young infant's mind, it's probably bringing up the emotions of fear, it's bringing up the emotions of uh, scaredness, uh, it's, I'm, I'm sure if we were to, you know, uh, uh, um, um, image these young infants' uh, brains, I would be willing to met, met their amygdala would just be firing because the amygdala responds to fear and anger and those types of things. And what is the infant learning in this situation? Well, one, they don't get their needs fulfilled. 
baby cries, mom, no one comes, baby cries. And when they do get their needs fulfilled, they're made to feel like they're a problem. They're a concern. They're the issue that you're a bother to that, that parent. Okay. And this is the development of mistrust. Okay. And what this is going to result in is going into the next phase, the child who has developed trust will be at a much better advantage to develop uh, autonomy, which is uh, the ability to act and behave on one's own, those types of things, versus shame and, and, and doubt, okay? And what I would like you to do between now and next class is I want you to uh, look up the difference between shame, doubt, and guilt. Uh, because as you'll notice on this slide, they're all shame and doubt are within the next developmental phase and guilt is in the, the, the third stage of development. And understanding the difference between shame and guilt and doubt is an important concept. So uh, between now and next class, um, I would like you to uh, look up those terms so that we, we're all on the same page and I'll ask at the beginning of class what you came up with. Uh, going back to trust versus mistrust, we're going to return to this topic in, in, in a little while when we talk about something called attachment theory. Uh, and we're going to expand on the notion of trust to mistrust to understand things that are called attachment styles. And, uh, you know, if we, if we uh, just a quick preview, if we look at a child who has complete trust, they have what we call a secure attachment, meaning that they can negotiate with their social world and be comfortable with the interaction with that world. Okay. And then we'll get into some less uh, um, uh, beneficial attachment styles, such as insecure attachment style, where the child will either over attach to their care caregiver. So this is the, the child who is around mom's leg and mom has to drag the child everywhere or the child is completely aloof where the child doesn't want anything to do with the parents. They could care less about them and sometimes may even act out aggressively. So we're gonna come back to this uh, uh, notion of the development of trust and mistrust and the notion of, um, of, of family, uh, a caregiver and infant interaction. And we're also gonna talk about it in the biological um, um, sense is what do you have to have biologically between the infant and caregiver to um, uh, have that attachment, have that closeness. And we'll see that there's chemicals involved. There's some um, the things like oxytocin, which is the attachment um, um, uh, uh, hormone. Uh, you need dopamine. You need dopamine to reward that process. And we'll look at what happens when there's a lack of those biological chemicals in the development of attachment and trust and mistrust. So that's kind of a preview of the different areas that we'll look at as we examine this, this issue in earlier in childhood. And we onboard one more theory, which is attachment theory as we move along. But with that in mind, uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, let me, I'll pause this, close that. Yeah.